Um, but there is a little bit of trouble that you can run into even before you reach the event horizon, um, which is has to do with tidal forces. So for a tidal force, basically the idea is that you have different strengths of gravity on opposite sides of an object. So under normal circumstances, you know, far from a black hole's event horizon, you might have a star that's the shape of a sphere, as stars usually are. But when that star is close to the event horizon of a black hole, it could get stretched into an oblong kind of football shape. So that would be due to tidal forces. Um, just to think about what it means for there to be different forces at different locations across an object, um, the Earth experiences some gravitational tug from the moon. Um, so at which of these four points would the gravitational force from the moon be the largest? All right, so if you chose A, you are correct. So remember from last time, uh, the gravity force is stronger for objects that are close together rather than objects that are far apart. So if you had an object at point A, it would experience a greater gravitational force from the moon than an object at point D. And this actually leads um, to, oops, sorry. The oceans get deformed by this effect because the oceans can but the land is rigid enough that it cannot be deformed by this uh, tidal force from the moon. And so the net result is that the entire, um, I guess, water in the ocean uh, deforms a little bit such that it's drawn toward the location of the moon. Meanwhile, um, the, you, can, you can basically think of it as the center of the earth is also slightly shifted by the moon's existence. And so you end up with two um, bulges of water out on either side, one toward the moon and one facing away. And this is exactly what causes tides. As we rotate underneath these two tidal bulges, then whenever we're underneath one of the bulges, that's where we're experiencing high tide. When we're not underneath one of the bulges, that's where we experience low tide. So this explains why we have, you know, two high tides, two low tides per day. Um, I go into a lot more detail of this on in Astro 121 if you ever take that class or if you have taken it. Go ahead. All right, anyway, my main point about tidal forces is that they stretch objects out. So just like the water um, around the earth gets deformed by tidal forces, um, so too can the gas in the envelope of a star. And maybe more severely, um, the, I guess, all the matter in anything that gets too close to a black hole and since the black hole has such strong gravity as you get, you know, especially within the event horizon, um, you can actually be squished all the way out into a long piece of spaghetti um, by the tidal forces of a black hole. And this is called spaghettification because astronomers like to have fun, I guess. Um, here's an astronaut getting spaghettified, which I don't think will ever happen. Um, nevertheless, you can um, basically destroy objects if they get too close because of the tidal forces. Um, and the reason that an object could get torn apart is because the tidal forces might actually exceed all of the other forces holding that object together. So, you know, for a star, it's mostly, uh, sorry, gravitational forces that hold the star together. For something like an asteroid or a moon or the earth, it's going to be electromagnetic forces between all the matter inside the solid body. Um, and actually, this effect of tidal forces being able to tear an object apart does happen because things like moons and asteroids can be destroyed by the tidal forces of large planets. So there's some evidence to support the idea that this has happened, at least in some part, to help form um, parts of Saturn's rings. Not the whole system, but parts of the system. So even though you're, you know, if the sun magically turned into a black hole, the earth would not fall in immediately. Um, but if, if some other object like a comet or something strayed too close, it could be spaghettified. All right, so I wanna just mention a few effects of relativity um, that are weird enough to just talk about. I don't think this is in your textbook, but maybe it is. Um, anyway, let's say that I have an indestructible space probe. We all want to know what it's like near a black hole, right? So let's send an indestructible space probe to find out. 
And as it approaches the event horizon, um, we're going to have our space probe send us signals in the form of light because we want it to tell us what's going on in there, right? Um, well, as it gets closer and closer to the black hole, this light is going to get stretched out because black hole is stretching space time, right? So um, if the uh, rocket ship, I guess, sends a, a pulse of light, then by the time it reaches us, it'll be stretched out a little bit. And it'll be stretched out more and more uh, the, the further that light has to climb out of the gravitational well. That wavelength got stretched of the light that we were sent in. So is that blue shifted or is that red shifted? Yes, that light is red shifted since it started at a shorter wavelength and now has a longer wavelength. And so this is called a gravitational redshift for that reason. So light entering a black hole is gravitationally redshifted if it, you know, if it's trying to point outward, right? Um, and at the event horizon, we would say that the gravitational redshift of light sent from the event horizon would be infinite. Um, so there's another weird effect here, which is that just as space is stretched, so too is time. And so the, um, if the probe was sending us, let's say a pulse every second, then we would receive those pulses uh, spaced farther and farther out in time until eventually we would receive no pulses at all. So for us, it would look like the clock, right? The clock that was responsible for sending us the pulses had stopped. But the probe would be just fine and wouldn't really experience this loss of time or this redshift. Um, the probe, well, would probably be destroyed by tidal forces, but that's why we sent an indestructible one. So not only does the light go, get gravitationally redshifted to infinity, but we also would see a time stop for an object falling into a black hole. So those are just some fun uh, consequences of relativity. They're not really pertinent to our conversation about the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So that's all I'm going to say about that.